Thomas Keegan with LibertarianProgressive.com, an independent media organization that interviews independent third-party candidates who are on the ballot this year and going to be on the ballot November 8, 2016. We believe if a candidate has gathered enough signatures to be on the ballot and has a statistical chance to win, then a responsible media will include them in the debates, interview them to educate and inform the public of their options. There's more going on this year than just the presidential uh, race. Congress is a co-equal branch of government, and we believe they should be getting a co-equal time in the conversation, our national American political conversation. Today we're interviewing Mark West, running as a libertarian candidate for the U.S. House of Representatives in District 1 in Arkansas. And you can find out more information about Mark at Mark West for Congress. Mark West, F-O-R, Congress.com. Mark, we're delighted to have you on the show today. And uh, good afternoon or good morning. How are you doing today, sir? And what got you into this race uh, this year? And is this your first time running for Congress, sir? Well, Thomas, uh, thanks so much uh, for having me on, uh, giving me the opportunity and the platform to talk about uh, this election and this race that's coming up. The reason I got into this race is I really believe that Congress has lost touch with uh, we the people. I believe that our government is supposed to be authorized by we the people and everything should flow from we the people uh, through the constitutional means. And, uh, you know, Congress is sitting at about a 10 percent approval rating because it doesn't listen to we the people anymore. It just kind of does what the special interests tell them to. And that's uh, one of the main reasons that I got into the race and is actually built into one of the key themes of my campaign. Uh, This is my first uh, officially on the ballot race. I did run as a write in candidate uh, several years ago in a uh, in a county race, um, I was a <laughs> my my whole campaign plan since I had applied for the ballot too late was I printed up a bunch of pencils that said write in Mark West JP District Six, and I went door to door and handed those out uh, to as many people as I could in the district, and I wound up getting about ten percent of the vote as a write in candidate in that race. So I was actually kind of proud of that because <laughs> I went from an unheard of uh, to that. Uh, but that's uh, that. So this is actually going to be the second political race, but it's the first one that I get to run as actually a a candidate listed on the ballot. Yeah, that's unheard of to get that high of a percentage as a write-in candidate. And congratulations on getting on the ballot this year, Mark. Um, has there been any debates? Are there any debates coming up for your district, sir? Uh, there haven't been any yet. Uh, we do have a debate uh, that will be on AETN, uh, which is the Arkansas uh, Public Television Network. Uh, it will be uh, Tuesday night at 7 o'clock Central Time. Uh, I do believe they will be, well, I know that they will be, uh, once the debate has televised, they put them on their website so it can always be um, accessed later. Uh, but, yes, we, we will be debating um, Tuesday or this coming Tuesday night, so I'm, I'm in full uh, debate prep mode right now. Uh, we have already done a practice debate. We're doing another practice debate tonight. Uh, it, it's just a lot of hard work to kind of. Well, you know, myself, I'm, you know, I'm not a full time politician. I, I work a full time forty hour a week job, and then I'm also a pastor, which eats up another twenty to thirty hours a week, and I'm a a father of uh, three children, uh, so the family time, you know, it, it is essential to my life. So it, it's been quite a time-consuming um, venture, uh, and it's taken a lot of hard work to get to where we're at, but I'm confident that the results will show up Tuesday night in the debate. Uh, I wish the debate format would allow for a little bit more cross-talk, but it doesn't. Uh, but we're just going to have to go with the format we have and try to make the points that we can. Uh, this is the only debate as of right now. I've contacted their uh, campaign, my opponent's campaign, to try to get another debate scheduled and haven't heard back. So so this may be the only debate. Yeah, perhaps this debate will spur on uh, more debates. And the debates have been an American tradition for the elections 
debates have completely decided some elections. People have said, well, let's look at your issues and what you're bringing to uh, your district as a platform here. And you have everything listed from the drug war, gun control, human rights, veterans, military, income tax, social security, retirement, immigration, national security, national debt, education, health care, and the economy. And so a full list of issues here so people can see a clear difference and a clear direction, right? And so let's start from the bottom up here. Um, How about uh, the drug war? Uh, Compared to the drug war to prohibition in the past, could you expand how, you know, you, Mark West, would approach the U.S. policy uh, regarding the drug war if you were elected as a U.S. representative? Certainly. Uh, one of the first steps uh, that I think we need to take is we need to deschedule um, cannabis uh, so that research can begin taking place, uh, you know, nationwide uh, to, you know, to explore the benefits, explore the health benefits. We have a lot of anecdotal evidence, and we've seen some uh, evidence uh, out of Colorado and other states where. Uh, cannabis is legalized, uh, where you do have medicinal benefit, uh, whether it's epilepsy or whether it's uh, uh, pain treatment. Uh, you know, it is you know a lot less addictive than a lot of the uh, pharmaceutical meds that are on the market right now uh, for pain treatment and other types of uh, mental illness treatment like uh, PTSD. Uh, I think if we deschedule that and we begin exploring those benefits, I would like to. I, if I had my druthers, I would just say that we deschedule all of them uh, and end the world together, but I know the American public isn't isn't ready for that. Uh, so I think if we can start with a, a simple descheduling of, of, of cannabis uh, so that research can begin taking place so that some of these communities can begin to see and experiment uh, and, and see that the impacts that we've been fear-mongered about uh, for decades aren't a reality. Uh, Colorado has proven as a test case that a lot of those uh, boogeymen that have been hiding in the closet for decades uh, weren't actually in the closet. They, uh, you know, the, we've not seen crime increase. Uh, we've actually seen teen use of, of cannabis go down. Tax revenues are, are soaring and they're able to, you know, fund a lot of good programs through the tax revenues that are coming in in Colorado. Uh, it's been an economic boost. Uh, so all the boogeymen that we've heard about cannabis, uh, uh, you know, they're they're just not a reality. And this will begin helping uh, along the way to getting us on the path to ending the drug war. I think it's sad and tragic that in our advanced American society that we continue to kill people over plants. It just, I, I don't see a reason to put police in the line of danger over plants. And we, it's a human life issue. It's a human rights issue. Uh, we've got to end this. It's it's not benefiting our communities. To it's creating war zones in some areas uh, because it, it, it's a it's a war, and the police have become militarized. And and so many of the police, because of the way the war has been fought, they are you know, more concerned and more frightened when they have traffic stops. You know, I think the best thing for everybody is just to get away from this policy of of locking people in cages because they use a plant, because they use a drug. Uh, Let's, you know, if if people have a problem with it, let's make it a a uh, treatment-type solution instead of a criminal solution uh, so that we can... Cut down the the expense that we have that we are putting into militarizing the police and and trying to fight this drug war and and the cost of keeping you know so many people in prison that their only offense is one against their own bodies uh, using a illegal substance. Uh, I think we're better than that, and and I think we're ready to move past that as a nation. Yeah, Mark, and I can appreciate you calling the plant cannabis. Um, Talking about a boogeyman, the I believe the term marijuana came as uh, to put kind of a racial aspect on it when it was made illegal, uh, you know, almost a hundred years ago, and to create a boogeyman kind of fever uh, environment about it. 
And so now we have refugees literally going to certain states so they can use this plant. And, and now people might have reasons that they don't want drugs to be legal, but they have to really ask, I think, it's not just you can feel that you don't want something to be legal or you don't want your kids to use it, et cetera, and I can understand that, but what are the best approaches, whether that's education, and what are the actual consequences? I mean, are you willing to lock up and split up families and put them in a prison because it's something that you don't agree with that's only you know, harming others, I mean, harming yourself, and don't people have a right to do what they want with their own bodies? And so so it does look like you probably have a clear difference with that, and actually it looks like the politicians probably have a clear difference with most electorate. If you look at most of the polls recently, I think you're probably in more of the consensus area, absolutely. Um, what about gun control? You have that listed. What's um, your direction uh, with the Second Amendment, gun rights, the ability to defend yourself. Well, this plays into one of my my central themes of my campaign as well, and it's that uh, the individual is the most important minority. Uh, we can't trust uh, D.C. politicians and bureaucrats to run our lives. Uh, they've tried to do it uh, for decades now, and it's 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 a abysmal failure, and it's a way of doing government that needs to stop. I trust individuals. I trust you to decide what's best for your life, uh, what's best for your body, what's best for your property, and the government really has no business uh, when it comes to your guns, when it comes to your religion, uh, when it comes to your uh, your property, your privacy. Uh, that That's not the government's business. We have to get the government out of people's business. Uh, I believe that people should be able to defend and protect themselves in whatever way they see fit. And they should be able to defend and protect their property in whatever way they see fit. You know, some people have more property, some people have less, you know, so they're each going to be, you know, answerable to their own conscience as far as am I doing enough to keep my wife and children safe or my husband and children safe or my partner and children safe. You know, we, we have to... We have to allow people that right. It's it's human right. It's not something that the government gave us permission to do in the Bill of Rights. The Bill of Rights is a stay against the government that says, hey, you can't get into these areas. And our gun rights is one of those areas the government is just not allowed to get into. It's a human rights issue. Self-defense is a human rights issue. Every person on earth has the right to defend themselves. And it is not a place that government should be allowed to go. And it is something that I will be a strong defender of if I am elected, that people have that right to defend themselves and the government has no say in how you're able to defend yourself. Yeah, and maybe something that would drastically reduce violence, gun violence, or violence overall is ending the war on drugs. And so should we legislate something for 99.999% of the population based on what, you know, maybe less than 0.1% choose to do to try to violate other people's rights? Um, what, well, yeah, exactly, here. and that's where a lot of your, your, your gun control legislation comes from is it tries to legislate on the exception. You can't legislate the exception. The exception is always going to exist. And everything you have, every situation, every circumstance, every legal question, you're going to have exceptions to the rule. But you can't base your legislation, you can't base the way you govern on the exceptional thing that might happen because you can't think of every exception. You just have to govern in a very general, broad sense and that means you're going to have exceptions, and that's just a natural part of life. It's a natural part of the course of human history. I guess that's true, Mark. I, I didn't think about it that way, but if we did govern according to the exception, we'd all probably just be locked in a closet somewhere, not allowed to do anything. <laughs> so, um, exactly. Now you, have, you have here listed uh, human rights. Uh, can you expand? Um, what does human rights mean to you? And, and what does it mean to you uh, representing others as well? Human rights for me personally, I'm a Southern Baptist pastor. 
And I believe that every person, you know, so I bring my my religious conviction to this this concept that every person is created by God. So we have to get back to this concept of humanity, uh, this concept where we have a respect for life, uh, whether it is the life of an unborn child, whether it's the life of a refugee that's fleeing ISIS in Syria, whether it is the life of an immigrant from Mexico, we have to respect life, whether it's the life of, of a a um, a black man who's been pulled over by the police, whether it's the police themselves. Every life has to matter. We have to get back to a view that humanity matters, that, that people's lives matter. And I'm afraid that our society has moved away from this this understanding of humanity and I think that is why we see so many battles in this country over you know you have your blue lives matter and you have your black lives matter and you have your you know pro-choice and pro-life and then you have your you know your some of your people are more hawkish on wars and they want to nation build and and spread democracy around the world and and we have all these things that but yet what each of these policies entails is a is a devaluation of human life. And I think in, until and unless we begin to value human life, each human individual, as I said, the individual is the most important minority. Each human individual matters. Individual lives matter. And we have to get back to respecting individuals and, and respecting the common humanity that we all share that, you know, and I say this as a pastor, it's not for grace. I could be in any one of those situations. I could be uh, the drug addict or I could be the homeless person or I could be, um, you know, some black teen that's got caught up in a gang or I could be some, uh, you know, Hispanic migrant worker who's just trying to make ends meet because where he came from there weren't any jobs or some Syrian refugee that's, that's fleeing for my life and for my children's lives. You know, I could be in any one of those situations, and I'm afraid that our society has gotten away from, from this this understanding that human lives matter and that every individual life matters. We're okay with bombs dropping and, and killing innocent people around the world, uh, but we're not okay with it if somebody shoots up a nightclub uh, in the name of ISIS. You know, all those lives should matter to us, not just the ones that are closest, but the lives all over this planet should matter to us. And it, and we need to be a part of protecting and defending life. If there is, if we are going to have a government, one of the few functions that a government should have is the pre- preservation of life. We should be a pro-humanity people in this country. Yeah, and it sounds like, what I'm hearing is uh, equality under the law as individuals, and also at the same time, maybe from a pastoral point of view, it almost equals the same thing as the golden rule, uh, you know, and uh, and since you did bring it up, um, the issue of abortion, choice, life, you know, et cetera, I know that's uh, probably going to be something that you're asked. Where do you stand on that issue, per se, as far as the government's concerned, sir? Well, I am personally pro-life, and as I said, I believe one of the few functions of government should be the preservation of life. However, what I also believe is that until we have built a pro-life culture, nothing will change as far as the abortion issue is concerned. Uh, You know, so many are talking about, you know, this election, you have to vote for this candidate because, you know, this candidate's pro-life, or, you know, they'll, they'll put this Supreme Court judge in. In my opinion, I think the Supreme Court is going to rule closer to what the cultural mandate is on everything. And I think that is why, um, you know, I think a lot of this is misguided, you know, this uh, where we have to appoint judges, you know, that are pro-life, or we have to appoint candidates that are pro-life. If you're pro-life, then, then, then prove it by the way you live. You know, if you're pro-life, then you should be opposed to the death penalty. If you're pro-life, then you should be opposed to letting people starve on your border, um, you know, because you won't let them come across. If you're pro-life, then then you should care that um, we that that American citizens 
die more at the hands of the United uh, of, of police in this country than they do at the hands of ISIS and terrorists. Uh, if you're pro-life, you can't watch what's going on in this world and say, oh, well, that's just people over there. Uh, we have to have a full-scope view of life, a full-scope concern for life. And in that concern, we have to be working in our communities. You know, if you don't like abortion, then work where you are to try to end it. And, and what I mean by that is, if you have a, a local crisis pregnancy center, go volunteer at it. Try to help those women that are in crisis pregnancies, the ones that you know are going to make these decisions to to end their pregnancies. Go and see if you can help them. Help them find options. Help them find ways to pay the bills. Help them find ways to take care of that child. Uh, you know, there's so many things that you can do. You can be in, you know, adopt. You know, get involved and engaged in adoption. If if, if you're pro-life, there are things that you can do in your local community to reduce abortion, because uh, that is the goal is to reduce abortions. I don't. I guess the the best way to say it to try to make sense out of all of it is I'm pro-life, but I don't believe you have to have a government mandate to. End abortion. I think it's something we can do by working locally where we are uh, to change hearts, to change lives, to make different choices possible, to make different choices reasonable. Um, it, it's not something that you you necessarily have to mandate uh, through the law. I, I hear what you're saying, and it's kind of like what I think John Adams said once: um, the type of government that we have is going to only be it's only going to work with a moral people. So you can't really legislate morality per se to a certain point. I mean, of course, there's consequences for, you know, stealing and, and robbing and killing and, and murder and stuff like that. But, um, but right. like you said, there's a lot of uh, inconsistencies on how we handle that in the first place regarding wars and, you know, police violence, etc. Now, what about the issue of veterans military do you have that listed here uh what's um the difference between you and your opponents and what's the direction that you'd like us to see handling that in the future well one of the the key things that i think we need to focus on with our veterans uh is and it's one of the things that my opponent is finally coming around to and i don't know if it's because of this race or what has caused it but he's Congress, he finally worked with Congress and they voted on a bill that's supposed to to help begin addressing the mental health issue. You know, 22 veterans commit suicide every day in this country. 22. Uh, that, that's just, you know, again, it ties back into the life issue, but it ties into humanity and it ties into if we are going to send soldiers around the world to fight these wars, then when they come back, we've got to take care of them. And mental health is a major pressing issue in the in the veterans community. Now, there's a lot of other factors that are playing into that uh, that have to be addressed as well. Uh, some veterans are concerned that if they get mental health treatment, they'll lose their guns, uh, which is why we've got to cut down this this rhetoric in Washington on guns um, so that these people get the help they need. Um, but mental health can't be as it is now. I think the bill that that the congressman has voted for and that you know that they're pushing is one that just basically creates more accountability on dealing with mental health. But what we really need to do in dealing with mental health is stop putting a band aid on it and let's let's heal the problem. What you find is so many soldiers that have mental health issues, PTSD, other things like that, they are prescribed a smorgasbord of drugs, pharmaceuticals, and all those are, are they're just treating the mental, they're treating the symptoms of the illness, but they're not dealing with the mental illness itself, getting to what's causing all the symptoms. And I want to see us as a nation begin to shift our understanding of mental illness away from treating symptoms and to actually treating the mental illness itself to actually make people whole again. Uh, so we've got to encourage uh, that, and that's what we need to be doing with our veterans uh, to to help them with their mental health. Another thing would be to end our international wars of intervention and our wars of regime change. If we don't watch it, we're going to be in World War III in Syria if we don't watch it, if we are not careful. 
we have got to scale back what we're doing in this world because we're wearing our soldiers out. We're having trouble keeping the best soldiers because the best soldiers are either going and working for uh, private contractors or they're going to work, uh, like I, I read recently an article that we're losing pilots because pilots are going to work for you know airline companies rather than stay in the military. Uh, we're wearing our military out with this. We need to get back to a homeland focus uh, with our military and and stop intervening and, and interfering in all these affairs in all these other countries because all we're doing is creating more veterans coming home with problems. And so we've got to reduce that problem, and that's going to be part of reducing that issue. Sure, and even though we do have an all-voluntary force, I mean, they're way beyond unprecedented limits on how many tours they're doing and how much time they're spending away from families. And uh, and we're in unlimited territories as far as mission creep is concerned. What about the income tax? Mm-hmm. Um, uh, you know, that's always a big issue for libertarians or for anyone, for that matter. How would you uh, – what should we do with the income tax well, I believe that taxation is theft, that the bottom line bare basis, especially the income tax, it is an involuntary tax. It is a compulsory tax, and it is extorted from people uh, with the threat of violence. Uh, so as a libertarian, that's a complete violation of the non-aggression principle to have an income tax, a mandatory income tax. So I believe that we should abolish the income tax and abolish the IRS. Now, there are a variety of other ways to fund government functions. Uh, we can do that through bonds. Uh, we can do that through any variety of other voluntary means of funding. Uh, you can even do a voluntary form of taxation where if people want the federal government providing certain services, they can you know, assess themselves a tax of whatever percent the government says would be enough to afford it to fund those certain services. But you have got to give the... And, and what I think this would do is it would help us cut the debt and it would cut the budget because we've got to get those things cut. Uh, we are putting our, we are way overextended in that. Um, you know, our, our national debt is our number one national security issue. It puts us at so much peril uh, in this world because the last thing that we need to have happen is for the economy to collapse out from underneath us uh, with military all over the world and with engagements all over everywhere. Uh, we, we've got to get that uh, under wraps, and we've got to get it uh, diminished. Uh, and part of that is going to be uh, – it, it will be helped if we can abolish the income tax and restore our government to a non-compulsory system of funding. Do you think a national sales tax instead of an income tax would be better or a step in the right direction or not even that either? either? It might be a step in the right direction, but I would really pref- not prefer that either because, again, you're still in a system of taxation that's going to benefit some and it's going to hurt others. You know, the, the sales tax always disproportionately hurts your people that are on limited budgets. Uh, the, those that are least among us are always more disproportionately hurt by sales taxes. So maybe um, at least probably an import tax, I guess, and other fees – uh, well, as I said, you know, you can set up any sort of voluntary funding system, but the funding for whatever government functions we have needs to be voluntary. Kind of like the post office, you pay for stamps. Um, actually, a post right. office should be the ideal conservative program, the government program. It's completely voluntary, and it pays for itself. And, right. Um, it, so I, and the income tax was only created in, what, 1913? Right. And... Um, yeah, well, so we, we existed a long time before that and beat the best military in the world <laughs> without an well, income tax. So. If there wasn't an income tax, I bet we would have an immigration problem of corporations trying to come to the United States. And we we probably would have, uh, for every job, um, you know, there'd be probably more jobs than there were people to fill those jobs. So, I mean, it would probably help workers a lot, too. I mean, so there definitely well, are some benefits there. Yeah, and that plays into the, to one of my other core themes, which is that we've got to get government out of business and get business out of government. Government, through regulation, through red tape, through taxation, they have made it 
impossible for small businesses to grow. A lot of them are are struggling, uh, killing jobs. We need to get we need to end this illicit relationship that we have, where uh, special interests and lobbyists are buying Congress basically, and they're buying influence, and you have this corporate form of welfare uh, that's played out through tax subsidies and other forms of subsidies. Uh, we, we need to bring those things to an end so we can begin creating jobs uh, in small businesses and, and in local communities because uh, that's where the economy will begin to grow again. I, I hear you. And what about um, Social Security, retirement, You know, the social safety net? How would you approach that, sir? Well, it's going to take a, a kind of nuanced position. Uh, principally, I disagree with a program like Social Security because, it's again, it's compulsory. But you can do Social Security voluntarily. And I know there are a lot of people that, I, I can't remember the exact number, but, you know, the percentage of our population that is at or near retirement age, you know, you can't just rip Social Security out from one of them because a lot of them, that's what they've counted on. You know, they've had this money taken from them through taxation, and, and it needs to be repaid. But I think for everybody else, we need to open up the option of, of getting them off of Social Security, eliminate, abolishing you know the, the payroll tax for them altogether so that we can uh, you know give them the option of, of funding their own retirement from their own means if they choose. But if people choose to stay in Social Security, they should be given that choice as well. But if they are going to make that choice, Congress has to have their hands off of Social Security funds. It has to be separately accounted, separately set aside for only you know Social Security and, and, and Medicare funding, uh, so that the money doesn't you know get get wasted again. Because that's that's what's happened over the years is you know Congress has used Social Security fund as a slush fund and has has robbed people of money they put in there that they're expecting to have when they retire. I would be willing to say this. I mean, if you got rid of the income tax but only had Social Security and Medicare, that would be a step in the, at least in the right direction. Um, and uh, what about immigration? What's your position on immigration? I think immigration, I really like uh, Governor Johnson, uh, our presidential candidate, put together a really good plan on that, that we need to uh, reform our uh, our temporary worker visa system so that we know who's coming in. You know, these people are going to apply for these temporary worker visas. Those that don't, uh, more than likely, aren't coming here to work. Uh, you know, if, if they're coming here to work, they'll apply for that temporary worker visa so they can be here and have, you know, that legal status and not have to worry about being deported. Uh, but those that are here for criminal reasons, they're not going to come over and apply for that. It'll help us segregate them out. You, you don't have to build a wall to deal with immigration. You can be smart about dealing with immigration. You can be very pro-family and pro-humanity in dealing with immigration. Uh, but you can have the temporary worker visa program, uh, and then you can also set up options where they can get into the you know, get in the line, so to speak, to you know for naturalization, if, if that's what they're coming here for, uh, you know, because they're wanting to actually immigrate fully and not just on a temporary basis, we can have a system set up for that. You know, we can have a system set up so that those that have come over and applied for temporary worker visas can transition into, you know, a, a form of naturalization through proper processes and vetting. And now, you have here national security as another issue. Um how would you approach our national security? You have that listed as one of your issues. Well, I think that national security, as I've talked about, starts with the, the debt. Our national debt uh, at $19 trillion and climbing is a national security issue. It puts our economy in peril. It puts us in danger of businesses leaving. It puts us in danger of uh, societal unrest. It puts international trade uh, at risk. Um and what it's doing right now is it's auctioning off our children and our grandchildren's future. It, it's dangerous, especially in this electronic and interconnected world that we live in. Uh, but also uh, you can take other steps, as I've already mentioned, ending our international involvement as far as uh, our nation building and our democracy building, our interventionism, our regime change policies, all those aspects of our foreign policy that basically, uh, for us, are creating more terrorists that need to stop. Uh, 
Uh, we, we are as much involved as that problem. We're as much involved as keeping that problem continuing uh, because of our policies. And these, uh, again, these are all policies that my opponent, you know, he's 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 a hawk. Uh, he, you know, wants the military involved in all these things. But I think that we can scale those engagements back. And when we do engage in the world, that needs to go through Congress. There needs to be a clear objective, and we need to do the objective. We need to end the mission creep, and then once we, the, our military is completely objective, bring them home. Uh, ending the drug war is also another part of that. If, if we had all drugs legalized, that would help cut the cartel traffic that's coming across our border because the profit motive would be gone. Uh, the whole profit in that is it is a dangerous thing to try to get illegal drugs. But if you make them legal, where people can get them and they can be regulated, and you can set up a means where the cartels lose their power. And if they lose their power, that also helps our national security because they won't have the reason to come across the border and try to cause those problems. Yeah, absolutely. And and you also mentioned a little bit about the NSA. And let me do a follow-up question with that regarding Edward Snowden, who's been in the news, or maybe not Edward Snowden specifically, but whistleblowers in general. Do you think they have the appropriate avenues, a whistleblower that is, to whistleblow without fear of retribution? Unfortunately, they don't. Uh, If they do whistleblow, usually um, bad things happen to them career-wise. Um, we don't want to admit that as a society, but when somebody blows the whistle on the government or on government figures, usually bad things happen for their careers, for their families, for their lifestyles. Uh, Edward Snowden, Snowden did what he could uh, in trying to get the information out to the American people. You know, He performed a, a service to the American people that our government should have been performing. Our government should have been telling us that they were doing these things, and our government was keeping that a secret. What else is our government keeping a secret? I imagine there's piles and piles of government secrets that we should know. These things that our government does are done in our name, and we should know. Now, mind you, we do live in an electronic age, and dealing with uh, you know that that's the other part of the the national security is we've got to <clears throat> amp up our cyber security. We've got to make sure that you know the transactions, the processing, everything that we are are doing uh, electronically, because we have a lot of infrastructure uh, that is run electronically. That we are guarding those systems. That we are putting the right, you know, electronic watches in place uh, over those systems. The right redundancies and all those other uh, technical jargon terms that that deal with these these types of industries. Uh, but we have to accommodate for the rights of the people. You cannot invade people's privacy in the name of security. Either we have a constitution and a country, or we don't. Uh, and uh, Edward Snowden shouldn't be brought back, and I'm hoping that he will be brought home and he'll be pardoned uh, before President Obama leaves office because he performed a vital function uh, that we need in our society that our media isn't doing of, of telling us the truth about what our government is doing. Yeah, so we either we have a constitutional, you know, uh, society and, and the rule of law, or we don't. And if we don't, I'd hate to think about some of the consequences for that. Actually, we can see some of the consequences of that. What about um, education? And then we'll go to healthcare real quick. And then I just have a couple follow-up questions, sir. Okay. Uh, my son is, uh, he, he battles a very close to a form of, of dyslexia. And with the national standards and the common core, uh, he was getting left behind. We wound up having to pull him out for a year and homeschool him so he could get back into school and and understand how to do uh, math and, and things, you know, other educational type things uh, for kids his age. Uh, we have got to get the federal government out of education. I believe that that would be a huge budget cut would be to just cut the Department of Education altogether, uh, restore all those funds and that that uh, control back to the local level, allow parents, uh, teachers, uh, local school administrators, allow them to work with the kids that they have to develop the best educational uh, 
system for them on the local level. Right? You know, in a lot of these local communities, you know, they they understand the industry that those kids are being raised into, and and some kids uh, like you know that that son I'm talking about, he wants to be a welder when he grows up. Well, you know, there's a lot of stuff he has to learn in school that has nothing to do with welding. But if we could transition our educational system away from the current gen ed requirements and begin opening up and align the flexibility uh, which you can have on the local level for kids to get training in, in welding or, or as a mechanic or you know any other type of, of industry, they can begin getting that training while they're in high school because they're not going to go to college and get that training. They're going to have to get it somewhere. So uh, let, let's work it in through our local education system so these kids at least get out of high school and they're ready for the job market and they're ready to work in the job market. Uh, so a local community aspect to education is what I would like to see uh, in our education. Sure. And how much we spend per student is um, I think around 10 or $12,000. I mean, if people could just get that money back or, you know, they could probably get tons of education than what they're receiving now. And, uh, there's a lot of education you could get for about twelve thousand dollars per student. I would imagine out there in the market. And what about healthcare? Um, how would you approach healthcare? Is the uh, Affordable Care Act a good thing, Mark? Uh, the Affordable Care Act has been a bad thing, uh, but unfortunately, it is something that was added because the healthcare system had been allowed to be broken uh, by our government. Our healthcare system problems are the direct result of government getting itself involved in business. Uh, the regulation, the red tape, uh, all the requirements, standards, the costs, the expenses. We, we had a we, we had a healthcare bubble, and we're still in the healthcare bubble where healthcare costs are ridiculously um, out of scope. They're inflated. Uh, they they need to come back to the mean. But unfortunately, rather than allow the free market processes to happen and allow that to occur. Insurance companies began just charging and guiding um, their clients more, and so now you have a problem where healthcare was too expensive, and then the insurance to pay for healthcare was too expensive. So what did we do? Well, rather than let the free market run its course and and have a have a have a period of deflation in the uh, a, a period of recession in the healthcare community, we just wrote a bill that said, well, the government's going to pay for all of it, and you know, most of the cost was created because the government stepped in and tried to fix problems that didn't exist to begin with, and now we've added more of a problem. And I find it hilarious that Bill Clinton was on the stump uh, two days ago for Hillary talking about how it's the craziest thing in the world. Uh, this Obamacare, you know, how people are working 60 hours a week and, you know, their their premiums are going up and they're not getting the health care choices they have, but now we've got 25 million, you know, people covered that weren't covered. Uh, the thing is, healthcare was available, and people had access to it until the laws began stopping hospitals from being able to uh, to treat people without insurance. You know, you, you have so many that that would. Uh, and Ron Paul is probably the best source on this, and he talks about the way the changes have affected the medical community. Um, it, the government stepped in; it created the problem, and then it passed the bill that claimed the system the problem and all it's done is created more problems. We need to repeal Obamacare and we need to get the healthcare system back on the free market where they actually have to deal with these inflated costs that are in insurance and inflated costs that are in healthcare and, and get healthcare back into a, you know, if you really want to make healthcare affordable, then put it back on the free market where they have the laws of supply and demand where you you know, doctors and hospitals can't overcharge and, and pharmaceutical companies can't overcharge and medical supply companies can't overcharge and insurance can't overcharge because people won't buy it and then you will see the cost go down. Uh, unfortunately, people in government, people that like to use the government to tell people how to run their lives want to try to do that with health care and we, we've got to stop that. Yeah, maybe also re-review some of the regulations regarding it as well. And um, so I do have some follow-up questions, Mark, here. Um, eminent domain, uh, it's probably not a huge issue, but it's a principled issue, and it seems like you know that's been more so an issue than in times past. 
how do you feel about eminent domain and what are rights that people have if they're um, in a situation where their property might be taken for eminent domain? Uh, to be honest, I hate eminent domain. I don't believe the government, any government, should be able to just come in and take your property. Even if they do pay you what they call a fair market for you, for for your property, they should not be able to take your property if you don't want to give it up. Uh, we, we have an issue here in Arkansas, um, and, and you, I don't know if you've heard about it, but there's a clean line energy that's wanting to run uh, transmission lines across the northern part of the state. And that's been one of the hang-ups is they're wanting to use eminent domain. And uh, fortunately for right now, uh, you know, our, our congressman is joined with other members of Congress to fight that and say, no, you, you can't do that. You've got to get land where people are willing to sell you land. Uh, and, and we have to go back to respecting property. Uh, the government, you know, again, those essential functions of government are to preserve life, liberty, and property. And one of the few functions government should have is to respect people's property and to allow them the right to their property. All right. And now, is there a role for government at all in uh, environmental protection? I mean, thinking about place ID things where potentially a corporation, I guess, could possibly cause more damage that they could ever pay back. Well, you know, it does play a limited role in that. Uh, we have to be very careful uh, because what you wind up with is where a government agency like the EPA has regulations that are so laborious and so expensive that it's killing business uh, just to meet the regulations. Uh, one thing you can do, though, is allow private citizens to you know, sue businesses on those grounds, on environmental grounds. Uh, you know what you find so often is you they won't allow citizens you know those opportunities for lawsuits uh, because they try to put it in the public sector and 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 shield those businesses from those costs and from that litigation. Uh, that is generally the role that they, that it would have. Uh, you know is you know the the EPA right now is. is in a drastic state of overreach, uh, and, and it's killing a lot of industries in this country uh, that, you know, aren't doing anything wrong, uh, but they're not meeting an EPA standard here, an EPA regulation, and and, and it's costing them uh, to have to... Uh, my, my job is in the, the power industry, and there are so many power plants that have to, you know, every couple of years, the EPA passes another regulation, and they've got to do more work on the power plant to install a, a scrubber or, or something of that nature to, to make the air cleaner when it's already really clean. Uh, it, it's already practically water vapor. When you see, you know, the smoke, you know, what people call smoke, that's not smoke, that's water vapor coming out of towers. Uh, and I think if we, the public would educate itself on a lot of these issues, it would help. Um, but we have to be very careful uh, when we enable government authority over business like that. You know, as I said, we've got to get the government out of business, and, and that's one of the areas where government has definitely overstepped uh, constitutional boundaries as far as business is concerned. Sure, and there are definitely horror stories, and I was just thinking of those towers, and uh, when you said there's those are water vapors instead of smoke coming out of them. We've probably all seen them driving down the highway and stuff like that, thinking that's a lot of smoke, but it's actually water vapor. Um, but uh, th there are also horror stories like the BP oil spill and, and things like that, and um, and perhaps they probably wouldn't even exist if it wasn't for big government contracts and uh, and shielding right. you know them from being able to be sued in the first place or making them have well, to like get the insurance. Flint water crisis. You know, you, we're sitting here two years into Flint, and Flint is like it is because the government let it get like it is. I mean, if you have private industry in that, when people start complaining and there's competition and somebody else can provide the water or do something different, then you can you, you have those those abilities and those freedoms. Right now, you don't have that freedom. You're, you're stuck in whatever the government gives you and whatever the government holds you to, so you wind up with a crisis like you have in Flint with the water, and, and it just continues to progress because the government is so handcuffed and handicapped in the way it does everything that 
it it's taken two years now to even begin to respond to it. Yeah, yeah, and also if uh, some of these companies, um, it, you know, if there there was if they didn't know that they would be bailed out, um, some insurance companies wouldn't even insure some of these practices in the first place. So uh, right. Well, good to talk to you today, Mark. Any final words of wisdom? Oh, actually, let me ask you one more question. Who's some of your favorite people, okay. past or present? Some of my favorite people, past or present. Um, that's a tough list. Uh, in near present, Ron Paul. Uh, he was one of the ones that that was a key to me becoming a libertarian. He at least uh, began the wake-up process for me. And uh, then a guy named Roger Paxton. Uh, I don't know if you know him, but he, is, uh, he hosts the Lava Flow, uh, which is a radio broadcast. He's the guy that actually, uh, I guess you could say he baptized me into libertarianism. Um, a guy named uh, Ron Langston, uh, he was the pastor that, uh, he was a missionary that turned pastor that put a, a true love of humanity uh, into my heart and uh, the ministry that, that he did in my life. Um, and of course, you know, my, my wife and my children are all pretty meaningful, too. Uh, but looking back to history, because any time I look at leaders, generally they use the, the state against people. And, and I have a lot of trouble, you know, saying I appreciate that. I can look at them and say I appreciate some aspects of what they did. You know, JFK, you know, tried to, at least in in some aspects, he tried to, deal with, you know, reconciling some of the racial differences we have. He dealt with trying, you know, he he, he peacefully resolved uh, some very um, amped up uh, times. Uh, you know, and then you have somebody like uh, uh, um, John Adams. You know, he is uh, one of the original, what I would call anti-federalists, uh, which is what my political philosophy is, is, is an anti-federalist uh, philosophy. Uh, I guess that would be be my list. You know, of course, Jesus Christ would be on there, but um, but that's I try to avoid the the token names that everybody else says. So, well, we appreciate those insights very much. And um, so, any final words of wisdom, Mark? I just you know, we can do this. We can work together to get the government out of business and get business out of government. Uh, we can work together to tackle the national debt and make our nation secure. We can work together to restore an American mindset where the individual is the most important minority. And those are the, the clear differences that I'm presenting this election cycle. I'm hoping that it gives uh, our nation a clear direction and, and a clear decision and that would be the vote for me in 2016. Well, we've been talking with Mark West, who's a libertarian candidate on the ballot this November 8th in Arkansas for the U.S. House of Representatives, District Number One. He's running to, uh, he's running as a contender to see if people elect him for at least you know two years and see what he can do. Uh, Mark, thank you very much for your time today. I hope you have a great day, and we appreciate it. You too, sir. Thank you.